Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Welcome. I've been looking forward to this for such a time. Um, we really feel that in Pancreas North we can actually achieve some of the things that we really would like to achieve by funding, or part funding anyway, the, the <coughs> research that's um, taking off apparently in, in, uh, in the Freeman. I'm not in a position, even if I wanted to, to tell you very much about it. That's what our speaker is going to do tonight. But I gather from Dr. Ansari that um, we have some results. We have some preliminary <coughs> results to share, and that's exciting. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Ansari now and look forward to what you have to say. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for coming along to listen to my um, progress with the research I've been involved with for the past year, which is really in the field of islet autotransplantation. Um, just to give you a quick outline, I'm going to talk for about half an hour to 40 minutes, and I'm going to start with a little bit of background. I don't know exactly what to what level of knowledge you all are at, so forgive me if I'm a little bit too complex or a little bit too basic in places, and I'd be happy to take questions at the end from everyone. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about chronic pancreatitis and then I'm going to move on to islet autotransplantation which is the focus of my research and a little bit of science which is involved there as well so that you can all understand the tests that I've been doing and then I'll go into more details about the specific project that I've been doing and uh, I've got some interesting results as I was saying earlier to share with everyone. So chronic pancreatitis is a condition which affects about 5 to 10 in every 100,000 of the population in Europe. It's essentially episodes of um, repetitive episodes of inflammation of the pancreas, and that results in scarring, um, which damages the exocrine part of the pancreas as well as the endocrine. The most common cause for chronic pancreatitis is excess alcohol consumption, but there are a number of other causes as well, um, which I've just highlighted here. So um, any condition which causes um, acute pancreatitis to occur again and again can lead to chronic pancreatitis. And then there are various hereditary and congenital conditions as well as others that can lead to it. One of the main um, symptoms that patients with chronic pancreatitis experience is severe pain, um, which is typically epigastric and, and goes through to the back. And a lot of patients end up um, having to take large doses of opiates, um, so morphine essentially, which itself has all sorts of problems um, with quality of life. Some of the later complications that, that result from pancreatitis are things like diabetes developing, which I'm going to talk a little bit in a bit more detail about later. And after having diabetes for some years, there are lots of other complications that result, such as damage to the eyes and the kidneys and that sort of thing. Um, patients also suffer from malnutrition, weight loss, um, and as I say, as a result of all of these things, a reduced quality of life, unfortunately. The treatments that we have at the moment for chronic pancreatitis, initially we'd start with um, recommending lifestyle changes. So, for example, if, if alcohol is the, the problem, then we'd recommend that people abstain from that, and that makes quite a significant difference to them. We can also um, give enzyme supplements, vitamin supplements, to try and replace the function that's lost in the pancreas as a result of all this, the damage to the tissue. And then there are various um, endoscopic and surgical procedures that we can do, the most drastic of which is removal of the pancreas, um, which is for pain relief. This is a diagram that just illustrates, if I can just show you, this is a normal pancreas, from a healthy pancreas um, removed from a cadaver. And this is just illustrating, uh, I hope you can all see it, It's um, it's a specimen that's been taken out when a patient's had a pancreatectomy, and it's, you can see straight away it's very red, very, very scarred, very inflamed. The management of chronic pancreatitis, as I said earlier, is essentially um, we start off with managing the symptoms, so pain control, um, enzyme supplements, that sort of thing. And then we can do studies to look at in more detail what exactly is causing, um, causing the, the inflammation. Some of the options can be drainage procedures, but what I'm going to focus on in my talk is, is um, actually resecting the pancreas. So total pancreatectomy with islet autotransplantation is indicated for people who have severe intractable pain from chronic pancreatitis. 
Um, it's indicated either if they've had previous operations to remove small parts of the pancreas and that's not resulted in proper pain control, or if um, the patient's got severe pain and they already have the complications of, um, of chronic pancreatitis, such as diabetes and exocrine problems, because in that case it wouldn't really make too much of a difference if you remove the pancreas anyway. But it's not an option that's taken lightly. It's a major operation. There's up to a 5% mortality and risk of lots of complications as well. So it's something that we have to really balance and weigh up carefully. One of the main problems um, which we find is that once we've taken out the pancreas, the patients are obviously diabetic because they no longer have the ability to produce insulin. And that type of diabetes is, is a different type of diabetes um, in that it's, it's a brittle form. It's, um, it can cause, patients can have sort of um, episodes where they'll just become very, very hypoglycemic suddenly without any warning beforehand, and it can really impact on the quality of life. And the other thing to say is that it doesn't always guarantee relief from pain, but it is quite successful in about three quarters of cases. The exciting research that I've been looking into is whether or not we can transplant the islets of the, the cells that basically when we take out the pancreas, I'll show you this in a little bit more detail uh, later on, but we can take out the cells that actually make the insulin from the pancreas and put them back into the patient's own body, into the liver, so that they can grow and start to produce insulin and hopefully prevent some of the problems that, that we see when we take out the pancreas. So this is a diagram that just shows the procedure. So once the pancreas is taken out, we um, take out, it, it's taken to a laboratory and undergoes um, a process where we can take out the islet cells, digest them using enzymes, and then they're purified and they're put back into the patient's liver through this uh, structure which is called the portal vein and hopefully once they get in there they should engraft and start to produce insulin. This is a picture of um, what, it, what the islets look like once they're isolated. So it's essentially a, a liquid that can be infused back in, containing cells that can be infused into the liver. And these are some of the um, this is uh, one of the, uh, the machines that we can use to isolate and purify the islets. This is a pancreas specimen, just to sort of show you how, how it all happens. And again, this is just a diagram that shows, um, this top part here is showing you how we can isolate the islets. Uh, what happens is when you take out the pancreas, there's a, there's a main duct through there, and we can in inject into that a solution which contains uh, chemicals that can break down the pancreas and gradually it becomes smaller and smaller until we take out the tiny little islet cells. Then they're purified and we take out the exocrine tissue and after that step we can put them back into the liver. And here's a picture of that. So there's a um, cannula that's been inserted into the portal vein there and we can put in the islets through there so that they get into the liver. The main um, the main criteria for success in islet autotransplantation is making sure that you've got enough islets um, being transplanted and that's one of the difficulties. You have to have enough of them and you have to have good quality islets that are working really well, that are secreting insulin really well and at the moment there's a real gap in that we don't have any good tests which really can look at how well a person's islets are working and, and um, what proportion of islets they have that are working well. And that's, that's what my research focus is really on, looking at tests that we can use in patients that we might be considering for an islet autotransplant so that we can, we can do these tests beforehand and, and have a good idea of whether, whether or not they're going to be successful. How do we judge, judge success? Um, it can be either a patient not having to take any insulin, obviously, um, if, if the islet transplants worked really well and they're secreting insulin from these newly transplanted islets, they don't need any insulin. But we also consider it the procedure successful if they're on a small amount of insulin, but they've got good glucose control overall. And the things that we look at when they're in hospital are um, things like C-peptide levels, which I will go on to explain what that is exactly. And just looking at good, good glucose control um, and making sure that they're not having episodes of, of hypoglycemia, which is where the sugar drops really low. This is a graph taken from a study that was done here, um, looking at a series of islet autotransplant patients. And if I can just explain to you here, this is, these numbers here just show the 
units, the numbers of uh, insulin units that people are having to take every day, and this is the time along here. This graph above shows patients who've just had a total pancreatectomy without any other islet transplant, and you can see that they're having to take quite high numbers of insulin, um, of units of insulin after the, after the um, pancreatectomy. And if you compare that with these patients who've had an islet autotransplant, you can see that they're on much lower amounts. Although you, you can see that towards sort of two years, three years, the amount of insulin they're having to take is increasing. So there are problems long term with, with islet rafts working at the moment. But I think in time as we, as we develop things more and, and find out more about um, exactly what's happening, we, we can hopefully make that better. And one of the things that my tests that I'm looking at can also be used for is, is assessing graft function after the transplant. So hopefully that should help there. One of, one of the one of the important things to say about that is that um, it, the reason that the number of the units of insulin actually increase over time is because we're actually probably starting off with an insufficient amount of islet tissue in the first place. So those islets that are transplanted may be working under exhaustion and eventually they fail slowly over a number of years. So if we can identify patients who can have a sufficient who have a sufficient island mass, we may not get that response later on, so the grafts may last a lot longer. And this is also just looking at a di slightly different thing, looking at um, there's a blood test that we do call HbA1c, which looks at how well a person has glucose control over a few months. And it just it's just really illustrating the difference between glucose control. So it's the lower the number the better really and um, show you this is patients one year later after their islet autotransplant the sugar levels are much lower than what they were beforehand I'm going to talk a little bit about exactly what the pancreas is um, what its structure and function is so it's just so you can have a little bit of an overview of that um, the pancreas is made up of endocrine and exocrine components and what that means is the endocrine parts are the parts that produce um, substances called hormones which regulate sugar levels and various other things. And the, the, there, there are over a million islets um, in the pancreas, but it only makes up a couple of percent of the actual gland mass. And there's various cells in there, um, which I'm, I'm going to talk about in the next slide. The exocrine component is really the part that, that secretes the enzymes which help with food digestion. So that's why patients with chronic pancreatitis, often there's scarring and that part gets replaced by scar tissue, which is why they have trouble with malnutrition and um, problems with, with sort of fatty stools and that sort of thing because the digestion's impaired. Um, very briefly then, the, the cells which, um, which the islets are made up of, there's four main cells, alpha cells, beta cells, delta cells, and PP cells. The, the main ones that are responsible for controlling glucose levels are alpha cells and beta cells. Beta cells are the ones that make insulin, um, and what that does is once you have a meal, you release a large amount of insulin and that brings down your sugar levels. And the alpha cells produce a substance called glucagon, which acts in the opposite way to insulin. So when people's sugar levels are low, that will help to bring them back up. And the other cells um, are really involved in just self-regulating the pancreas and, and regulating when and how much of your hormones it releases. Um, it's important for me to just tell you very quickly about insulin and C-peptide because um, I think you need to understand that so that you can understand the tests that I'm doing. This is a diagram here which shows um, insulin beforehand. What happens is, in, from the beta cells, they, the beta cells are cells inside the islets in the pancreas and when they're stimulated by um, a high sugar level, for example, they'll release a molecule called proinsulin and that's this over here and it's made up of you can see the two red chains, you've got um, an alpha chain and a beta chain, and this blue chain is something called C-peptide. And then before it can be activated, it has to be split up into parts. And this blue chain, the C-peptide, is released. And the reason that that's important is um, insulin and C-peptide are, are secreted from the cells in equal amounts. And there are some problems with looking at insulin in the type of studies that we're doing, in that um, the levels can change depending on various circumstances. It's not a very reliable reliable thing to look at in the blood when you're looking at things minute by minute. But C-peptide, on the other hand, is a really good sort of surrogate marker of insulin because it's not affected by all of those things and it's an equal amount. So we know that the amount of C-peptide <coughs> produced is equivalent to the amount of insulin. And that's one of the things that I'm looking at in my test, which is why I thought I should just explain that. When insulin is released, 
um, it causes glucose to be taken up, so sugar levels which rise after a meal, it causes the glucose to be taken up by the liver and muscle cells. And insulin is released in two separate phases, which again is important when I come to explain my tests. Um, this is a graph of, this shows you how much insulin has been secreted, and this is a long time. Once a person has um, glucose in their bloodstream, they have what's called a first phase insulin response, which is where insulin re is released in the first two to three minutes. Um, and then after that, you have a longer phase, a second phase response, which lasts for half an hour to an hour, for example. And they're, they're quite different mechanisms, the way, the way that they're released, but they're both, they're both important, and I'll, I'll come on to why when I explain the test. This is a picture of a cell releasing insulin. So you've got glucose molecules coming in, and that triggers a, an enzyme pathway, which causes, eventually causes insulin, which is stored in granules, to be released from the cell. And once that's released, it has, as I said earlier, the effects on um, the liver and the muscle to, to take up glucose. Uh, I apologise for this um, slide. There's a lot of text on there, and I, I don't expect you to read it all, but it's just really to illustrate that there are so many tests out there that we can use to look at glucose control in patients who've had pancreas and islet transplants. But the ones that are highlighted in red are the three that I'm looking at, um, and I'll, I'll talk about those in a bit more detail. The aim of the project that I'm doing now is really threefold. First of all, um, to try and help identify which patients are the best candidates for doing an island auto transplant, because it's, it's very difficult at the moment to tell that with the current tests that we have. Um, patients who've got chronic pancreatitis depend on how many cells are remaining that work, that work well, and that's why we need these tests to, to try and help identify those people. The other thing is Mr. White was saying is as you saw in that graph earlier, the, the amount of insulin that people were requiring later on was gradually creeping up. And if we can find out early on, after the transplant, which people are at risk, then we can intervene early on and try and sort of save those graphs, if you like, if that's possible. And the other thing is um, that these tests will also help us in the future to try and select people who might be good candidates for something called living segmental pancreas donation, which is, you've probably heard of people donating kidneys to relatives, it's a similar sort of thing, they can donate half of their pancreas. So this will hopefully help select people um, for that procedure as well. In a study that I'm doing, I'm looking at six different patient groups. So I'm looking at patients who've got chronic pancreatitis, patients who've had um, what's called a distal pancreatectomy, which is where half of their pancreas is removed for, for whatever reason. Um, and then I'm looking at patients who've had Islet auto transplants, and there are, there are a group of patients who um, hopefully will be coming along to have these tests done soon, and that will be really interesting to, to compare with the others. Um, and then there's also, we've done about three islet allo transplants in Newcastle, which is slightly different. It's, the principle is the same that you're transplanting these cells that make insulin into the liver, but they're not the patient's own, they're taken from other people, so they're really for treating diabetes. Just to go back to the eye auto transplant, was there patients actually that um, had their total pancreatectomy and eye transplants in Leicester and they were the ones that I did before I arrived in, in Newcastle. So in collaboration with my old centre, we're hoping they'll come up and sort of participate in our study. Mm. We've got another grant from um, um, for, for that particular part of the study, not related to Pancreas North. So, the whole pancreas transplants and the islet transplants are related to um, another grant, whereas chronic pancreatitis and distal pancreatitis are related to the work that you've kind of helped us with. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also <coughs> going to compare all of these results with uh, healthy controls um, so that we can see, when I show you later on, you'll see the difference between, for example, a healthy control who's got no pancreas disease and and what happens to the pancreas function after an operation, for example, to remove half the pancreas, you'll see quite an obvious difference. The, the main criteria to select people for this study is to make sure that, it, firstly, that they've not got diabetes, and the way that we do that is a, called an oral glucose tolerance test. Um, and then there's a couple of other things just within sort of that age range and, and make sure that their kidney function is okay. So the study that I'm doing essentially involves um, patients coming in for three separate mornings. I do these tests at the RVI, which is about 10 minutes away from here, just across town, 
and patients come in on three separate mornings for these tests. So they have, first of all, this oral glucose tolerance test, which tells me whether or not they're diabetic. Um, and as I say, they have, to, they have to not be diabetic to take part in the study because that would influence the results. Um, the, the other test that I do is called a step glucose infusion test. And I will, again, talk about that. I'll, I've got a diagram that will hopefully explain that a little bit more simpler later on. But essentially what I do is I, I give them um, through a vein into the bloodstream um, higher and higher rates of glucose and challenge the pancreas and then I can take samples to see how well the pancreas is handling that challenge so I can measure their glucose levels, their insulin and their C-peptide levels at different rates and it's, it, it's a test that's, that really accurately measures the variation every minute that the pancreas um, islet cells are having to the challenge that I'm giving so it's, it's quite a unique sort of test. And the other test I do is an arginine test, which looks at um, the first phase response. Um, if you remember a couple of slides back, I showed you there was like an initial peak in the first couple of minutes when insulin is released. Um, and that test looks at that, that particular response. And it measures the maximum amount of insulin that a person can secrete, can produce at that time. And one of the really interesting things about that test is that it, it correlates really well with how many beta cells a patient has. And I'll, that's one of, the, um, one of the really nice things that my data will show later on. This is just um, to show you the, the, we use the World Health Organization criteria for diagnosing diabetes. So this is what I look at when I bring in somebody and do an oral glucose tolerance test. Um, I measure their blood sugar after an overnight fast. And then I give them a drink of glucose aid, um, a set amount equates to 75 grams of glucose and then I measure their sugar level again at two hours and, and I can find out whether or not they're diabetic based on that. The step glucose infusion test, um, patients have to fast overnight and the test takes about three hours time and it has essentially four steps, um, each lasting about 40 minutes and at each level of the test I, I'm giving them a glucose infusion and I'm doubling the concentration well, sorry, not, not concentration, the rate I'm doubling at every step. So I start off with two milligrams per kilogram, and then four, then six, then eight. And the whole test takes about three hours to complete. And along the way, I'm taking samples for insulin and C-peptide and glucose. And when we get all of the res results at the end, we can see how well the pancreas is functioning um, when we give it that sort of challenge with the glucose. One of the things that we need to do in order to get these samples is something called arterialization. Um, what that means is that we can take samples from a vein, but the samples become like arterial blood because we heat the hand up inside a hand box, everything dilates, and it's, it's the equivalent of having arterial samples, and that's just something which is, that, that is the technique that's done pretty much everywhere around the world when we're doing that test. This is just to try and sort of explain to you um, the stepwise manner in which we increase the rate. So we start off at time zero, I take a sample there at minus 10, we start off at time zero, I, I start the glucose drip, and then um, I'm measuring the insulin, the C-peptide, and the glucose levels at various points along that step, and then at 40 minutes I double the rate to 4 milligrams per kilogram, and keep doing that until I get to the last step. With the arginine test, I give, um, Again, it's, a, it's an intravenous test, so I inject five grams of arginine into, into the bloodstream after a fast, an overnight fast. And arginine is a substance which, it, it's naturally produced in the body, but when you give it in a high dose like that, like five grams, it causes a rapid surge in insulin, and it, and it shows, um, when you look at the, the, the graph at the end of it, well, which I'll show you, it shows the first phase response, the acute insulin response, and that also requires arterialization. This is to show you the type of um, box that we have to use when patients come in. We have to, that's connected to a heat source and we have to heat the hand up to about 50 degrees um, for the whole duration of the test. Uh, and, and that causes the, uh, the samples to arterialize and, and we take samples for uh, insulin and C-peptide through that. And uh, I'm going to share my results with you now. So I've not put in all of the patients. I've just tried to pick out the ones that I thought would be relevant to um, to help you understand exactly what's, what, what the results are showing. So I've, I've included three healthy controls, three patients, sorry, two patients who've had half of the pancreas removed and one patient who's um, a patient with chronic pancreatitis.
We just to say we have done, we have looked at other patients, but for the we didn't have time to get all there the assays. There were just too many graphs, yeah. and it was um, so a bit too much. So we have got others to show, but we just didn't have time to get all the assays and analyze all the data before the meeting. Mm -hmm. So this is to show what an arginine test looks like in a normal, healthy control who's got no disease of the pancreas. Um, I've got I've put all three controls on the same graph, so you can see they're all. They all follow quite the same pattern. Um, the maximum insulin response, which is this sort of peak over here after we give the arginine, we give the arginine at this point, time zero, and then it shoots up. And the maximum peak is pretty much, it's between about 100 and 120 for all the controls. So it's quite similar, it's quite a reproducible test. And it only lasts for a couple of minutes, and then you can see it comes down and tapers off there. Now, if you compare that to somebody who's had a distal pancreatectomy, you can see there's a blunted response because if you look at the peak here, it's it's about 60 to 70. So in the healthy controls, it was about 120, and in the people who've had half their pancreas removed, we know they only have half of the number of cells. So it's just to show that this test really does does correlate really well with with the beta cell mass. And again, you have the same sort of response: it the acute insulin response, which lasts for a few minutes and then it comes down. This is. Uh, the arginine test result in a patient with chronic pancreatitis, and um, unfortunately, this patient has a really a really poor response. Um, their maximum insulin level is about 30, which is a quarter of a normal healthy control. So you can see just what the damage and the, the scarring over time can do. And again, just comparing the last few patients um, together on the same graph, you can see. The blue line at the top, that's the best result, that's the result of a healthy control. And then the pink and the yellow are people who've had half their pancreas removed. And then down at the bottom is the, the poorest response, which is the patient with the chronic pancreatitis. So by using this test, we can, we can see straight away who would be a good candidate for either autotransplantation and who wouldn't. Obviously, the patient with the poorest response, we know beforehand that they're not, they're not going to do well because the, the, the pancreas function isn't good to start off with. We think that this test will be a good predictor to, to ensure that you know most of our patients may come off insulin and uh, the, the, the actual routine tests we have are not as specific as this and we think that by doing this before and after transplant we'll get a better idea of who would be suitable and who wouldn't. The problem is that nobody's ever done these tests relating to either cell replacement therapy so this is why it's unique in that it will help us quite significantly. And the stepped glucose infusion test, which is the other test that I do. So again, just to show you the results from some healthy controls, the blue line um, at the top here is the insulin level, and the pink line is the glucose level. And as I said, every 40 minutes I increase the glucose rate. So you'd expect to see um, a, a rise in the, in the insulin level in accordance with, with the glucose going up. And that's exactly what that patient's demonstrated. Um, and again, these this is also another healthy control. You can see the same sort of pattern. The glucose level stays at a reasonable level, so they're, they're not becoming hyperglycemic because they're producing more insulin, and that's bringing things back into control. And this is another healthy control. So again, it's, it's quite, there is some variation between individuals, but you can see that the pattern's pretty much the same. And then this is a patient who's um, had a distal pancreatectomy. And this was a really interesting result because the, um, the insulin result is actually much, much higher than the, than the normal controls. If I just go back and show you, we were getting sort of levels of about 40 to 40, about 40 to 50, um, the, the, the level of insulin for the healthy controls. And when we compare that with this patient, um, their insulin level is about 130. And I'm, I'm not really quite sure why that is, but one of the things I noticed that was in this patient, the glucose levels are, aren't so well controlled. So although they're secreting a lot of insulin, it's, it's either not doing the job right or, or the glucose control is poor and therefore the pancreas is trying to compensate by producing more insulin. But I think that's something that I'll find out more about as I have more results. Another explanation is that this patient has probably got half the number of islets as a, as a control patient. So going back to our islet autotransplants, we think that what happens is when you've got half the number of islets, that the islets are actually overworking and secreting a lot more insulin, and eventually they get exhausted, and that's why the graft fail. So, in this situation, it gives us an idea of the quality of the ways the islets produce insulin. So it's quite important. 
and it's similar in the next patient. It's not as high, but it was still higher than the healthy controls. So the insulin level is about 60 here compared to about 40 in healthy controls. And again, the glucose level was quite high there, about 16, 17. And this is a patient with chronic pancreatitis who actually, it's quite the opposite. Their insulin levels are much, much lower. Um, I think it was about 34 on that graph compared to sort of 40 to 50 with the normal controls. And, and the, gluco the glucose level actually wasn't too bad for this patient, but the insulin levels were quite, quite poor. So when you compare them all together, you can see um, the pink line at the top, the best result. This is an arginine test again. This is um, showing what a normal healthy person's pancreas will do if you give them arginine. They've got a good healthy insulin response. And then down at the bottom, the lowest result here is the patient with chronic pancreatitis. That's not to say that all patients with chronic pancreatitis would have that sort of result. I'm sure there will be variation. This is just one example that I've included. And then um, the others are just um, mostly, we have some healthy controls in there. And there's another patient with distal pancreatectomy who's these, uh, the yellow and the turquoise lines, so it's sort of halfway between. And with the step glucose test, again, just looking at all the different patients, um, the pink line is the healthy control, the yellow line is the patient with a distal pancreatectomy who's, who's producing a lot of insulin. Um, and then down here you've got um, healthy controls and the dark green line again is the patient with, with the worst pancreas function. And these are just looking at glucose levels. Sorry, the last graph is looking at insulin levels um, in response to glucose and this is looking at what happens to the glucose level. Um, so this is actually the worst, the, the, the patient at the top here is the patient with the chronic pancreatitis who has the worst um, insulin function, so they've, they've actually got very high glucose levels. So I think what my um, results have shown at the moment, although they are preliminary, I think they've shown that the arginine test does work, it's reproducible, it assesses the maximum amount of insulin that a person can produce in response to that challenge. Um, you can see that response straight away in the first couple of minutes as a, as, a, as a large peak and it correlates really well with beta cell mass so you can see the difference between the response with a patient who's got um, a normal healthy pancreas and somebody who's had half their pancreas removed. Um, and Sorry, yeah, that's what I can say, that you can see the blunted response after the distal pancreasectomy. And with a septic glucose infusion test, it is um, a test that looks at glucose control and insulin function over a much longer period of time, so over a couple of hours. And in that test, it's, it's really a very dynamic test. We're looking at people's pancreas function um, at a sort of minute-to-minute -minute variation level, as opposed to other tests where you give a large challenge and then you just look at something an hour later. This is looking uh, every five or ten minutes we're taking samples and we're looking at exactly what's happening as we're preparing the rate of the infusion. And again, as I was saying, it was interesting to see that some of the distal pancreatectomy patients have got very high insulin secretion, but their glucose control isn't as good as normals. Um, and that's something for me to look further into, I think. In terms of future application of the tests, I think I'm quite confident that these tests will help selecting the right patients for an INA autotransplant procedure. And I think they will also be very useful in looking at graft function after transplant. And again, also as I was saying in, in one of my earlier aims, um, I think they have an application in looking at people who might be suitable for donating half of the pancreas. In the broader sense, these tests can also be used in various other groups of patients. I think that tests like this haven't really been used um, in, in other areas, and I think um, especially the step glucose infusion test hasn't really been used in other areas. And I think that will be a very good test at looking at um, patients who've had an either allo transplant and also patients who've had other, um, other procedures, surgical procedures in the pancreas that might reduce the beta cell mass. So I think to finish, um, I do need greater numbers. Uh, and at the moment, I'm only sort of halfway through my project. I'm still recruiting patients. There's still a lot of complicated statistics to be done to look at the results properly. And this was just a snapshot of of the most interesting results that I had at the moment. Um, but I think it's, it's certainly looking, looking very encouraging.
And I'd just like to acknowledge, um, obviously, Pancreas North funding the project, as well as um, Astalis and uh, my supervisor, Mr. White, and uh, Professor Walker, who's one of the endocrine consultants at the RBI, who's taught me the tests that I've been doing, how to do those. Um, Mr. Charney's helped with uh, recruiting patients, and um, this lady uh, who helped me with the lab assays in it. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to say, how do we back to you? Yeah. I was going to ask, yeah, if you've already had your yeah, pancreas removed, mm. yeah, you said quite near yeah, the start that somebody had added cells from somebody else or something. Yeah, that's so right. Kind of like, you know, it's 10 years ago, could I still have an eyelid transplant? Or if you've had your pancreas yeah. removed, could you have an eyelid transplant? Uh -huh. In and theory, I don't in theory yes, you could, but yeah. it depends how your, what sort of your uh, diabetic control is like, and whether you have any problems mm -hmm. with your diabetes. So it would just be if you're having trouble. Yes. Well, say, for example, if you're taking, um, I don't know, having a lot of hypoglycemia, for example, mm -hmm. um, and if your blood glucose control wasn't very good, mm -hmm. and you were developing potentially complications from your diabetes. Mm -hmm. Generally, there's a rough cutoff. Patients who are under 50 could have a whole pancreas transplant. Patients who are over 50 generally an eyeless cell transplant. If you don't fancy a big operation and you're under 50, then you can still have, you have an eyeless transplant if you wish. can see that as you make decisions about suitability, there's going to be a certain amount of interpretation, isn't there? Mm. Um, I mean, from what you said, the, the criteria for suitability for autotransplant, um, you've got a clear idea of, uh, of what those criteria are, but will they need um, interpretation before you can, with a particular patient, say, if I can first, well, it's a good idea for you. Do you mean as, as opposed to just doing a total pancreasectomy for the patients that would be suitable for an yeah, island or yeah, transplant? Yes, exactly. Well, I, at the moment, there, there aren't any any very, any very accurate tests that will mm. tell us that, mm. and that's really where I'm hoping that my project's gonna, yeah. gonna shed light on that area. I'm hoping that through doing these sorts of tests, we can look straight away at a patient's pancreas function and say, this patient, is going to be ideal because they've got enough eyelets, they've got a very good result on the RGE test yeah. and, and their, their eyelets are functioning really well as opposed to a patient, for example, the patient that I showed you with the chronic pancreatitis who had a very poor response on both of the tests. I, I think at the moment that's the only way that I, I think that we can judge suitability. You, there will be some who will rule themselves completely out and some who will see ideal patients. Yes. But there will be a grey area in the, the middle. Area in the middle, yes, that's well, what the, the other the other important thing that, that we do when we do an eyelid cell transplant, we have sophisticated ways to actually count the cells. Ah, yes. I see. So if you work out the body mass of the patient and you put X number of cells per kilogram of the patient and you look at these tests before and after you can yeah. more or less work out how many eyelids they're gonna need to get off insulin. Yes. So it's quite a clever way of doing it. That sounds more reassuring to me as a potential yeah. patient than, than words like enough. But nobody has, has done correlated these tests with actually the actual volume of the transplant that you put in. Thank you very much. Thank you. How long is your test running for? How long will it be for you know for sure? Um, well, I'm halfway through at the moment. I think probably over the next year I should get the rest of the patients in and then Along the way, we'll get all of the data analysed. We're hoping that within a year, a year. You know, we'll have done some transplants and then we'll have a bit yeah. more of an idea as well. Mm. Can I ask? I just love the people who keep coming back regularly, or people who have been signed up. The pancreatitis. Sorry, I didn't understand. Do you mean for an iron auto transplant? Oh, for any of these tests. People coming for the tests? Um, well, so it's not really specific. We're looking for patients who have had sort of half the pancreas removed, who are not, mm. who are not diabetic, 
and patients who might be suitable who come to Richard Chalmers Clinic or myself who might be suitable for a, who might need surgery plus island cell transplants as well. So they're the sort of patients we're looking for and anybody who a healthy control who hasn't got any sort of pancreatic disease, who's had no surgery and doesn't, you know, have diabetes. Mm -hmm. It's just it's patients in those categories in the public that have got diabetes. Okay, so you probably wouldn't be suitable for these sorts of tests. Mm -hmm. Most of the healthy controls have, have been done now, it's just um, some of the other, the other categories of patients that I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. See, one of the problems is a lot, of, as you know, you know, Newcastle is the centre, the Freeman is there's a pancreas centre in the north and a lot of our patients live a long, long way away so it's quite difficult to, um, some of them are still managed in the peripheral hospitals a long way away from Newcastle and it is quite difficult for them to come and have these tests so we are finding that a bit problematic but um, we, can, we can cross that bridge I think. Okay, so More questions? Say a big thank you then, uh, which I will do <coughs> sincerely. Many thanks um, for for such a clear ex explanation. Um, it always surprises me. Um, medics coming to talk to Pancreas North never pull their punches. Um, you always give us the story. Nobody gets talked down to in these talks. And I personally, I, I think. We're all very grateful for that. Real clarity, but all the detail that one needs in order to uh, make an assessment of what you're talking about. And I'm particularly grateful, if it's the case, as I gather from you just now, that you've actually um, managed to push through results in order to get a, a talk ready for us tonight. Um, if that's the case, doubly thanks and thank you for the clarity of the exposition and it just remains to say what a worthwhile thing you're doing and the best of luck with the second and the rest of the phases of it thank you so much. we shall look um, with great interest and perhaps you, you'd be so kind at a later date if it's a year's time or something like that that you're talking about when you've got more results and actual yeah we, we, we'd definitely come back and it'd be nice you know if we could right. get our laboratory sorted out and yeah. have yeah. some a bit more yes. I don't know a bit more we may have some patients to present who have been through all this and well that would be good it? would be great because yes, without that. your help we wouldn't be able to do it yes well perhaps we look forward to rounds two or even three yeah, in, exactly. in this one um, in, in a sense as I said at the, at the start um, Pancreas North, um, in, in our committee, we sometimes wonder whether we're doing what we need to do, and we, we beat ourselves up a bit occasionally about our effectiveness. But this is something which I really feel rather proud to be associated with as a little group. We're only a small group, and it's great, I think, that we've managed to, to do this bit. This is really specialised, and the, you know mm -hmm. there aren't many places that do this in the world. Mm -hmm. And to be a small organisation that is helping towards that, you know, mm -hmm. gives us a lot of satisfaction. I'm sure it will do when we get to the end. Yeah. We can do some transplants. Yes. Well, I'm 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 saying my remarks to my committee co-committee members as well because I think we're all rather proud of you and what you're doing, and pleased with ourselves to be associated with it. So. Many thanks to you both. Thank you. Another cup of tea waiting, of course. <laughs> and uh, some ra terrific raffle prize. <laughs> so shall we go back next door?